Hello, and thank you for joining me. Thank you for taking the time to join me today for another presentation as part of the Gray Learning webinar series. I am Tim Gray, and I thought I should mention right up front that, you know, for me, photography is in large part about preserving memories, about going to great places, having great experiences, and then as part of that process, capturing photos to preserve those memories, to record and document those memories. And so I want to have those memories represented with the best photos that I possibly can. And so today we're going to talk about increasing or improving the impact of your photos. Before we get started, I do want to say thank you once again to Tamron for sponsoring the Gray Learning webinar series for making this series of presentations possible. If you get a chance, if you haven't already, be sure to check out their One Location, One Lesson, One Lens series. You can find their YouTube channel at youtube.com slash tamronvids. And soon, stay tuned, either in a future webinar presentation or in the Ask Tim Gray email newsletter. I'll be announcing soon a video there that features yours truly. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about adding impact to your photos. And I suppose then the first question is, what exactly is impact? And so when it comes to impact for the photos, we're really just talking about sort of a special something. I, I think this is the wow factor, something that makes the photo stand out. And really, it's sometimes difficult to describe. It's not like I can tell you, you always need to have this particular attribute and your photos will have tremendous impact. In large part, it's really more about how viewers respond to your photo. And when their eyes light up and they say, wow, then you know that you've created some impact in your images. So I'm going to give you a variety of tips, hopefully to help you add that impact, add that wow factor to your images. And in large part, I think of this just as literally thinking about your photo, being more thoughtful. And I find that whenever possible, if you can take a little bit of time to think more about how you're going to compose a photo and the various attributes, the various circumstances that lead up to a great photo, that you'll be better able to produce those great images. So let's go ahead and dive in. First and foremost, this one's a little more of a technical issue, and it mostly relates to quality. And of course, image quality can have a big impact on the impact of a photo. And that is exposing to the right. And what this really means is kind of shifting that histogram over to the right, which in turn means that you're exposing a photo as brightly as possible, but without clipping any highlight detail. And so what that's going to do is maximize the light. And in the context of photography and digital photography and imaging, light is the information that we're capturing and more information is better. The opposite of information is noise, so more information equals less noise. And that in turn means a better quality image, more detail. We always can adjust the overall luminance for a photo in post-processing. I'll talk about a few tips related to post-processing shortly. But the point is that a brighter exposure without clipping the highlights will generally give you better quality, all other things being equal. Of course, we don't want to ignore other aspects of our exposure settings, the shutter speed, our aperture setting, ISO, etc. And so paying attention to all of the variables that relate to our photographic captures but whenever possible, having that exposure be a, as bright as possible, again, without losing any highlight detail. But most of the tips that I'm going to share today relate a little more, I guess you could say, to composition. And one of my big pet peeves when it comes to composition is simplicity. And that's not to say that every photo ought to be as simple as possible, but I would say that in general, Photos that have a little bit more simplicity tend to have a little more impact. Making sure, for example, that in general there is a single key subject in our photos and not a variety of different subjects. In other words, the viewer knows exactly what the subject is and knows where to look in the photo. And sometimes we might get tempted. So here is a photo captured out in the Palouse region of eastern Washington state, one of my favorite places. Obviously one of my favorite places to visit because I've been going out there every year for 10 years now leading photo workshops. And sometimes you'll just have a combination of subjects. So here we've got a canola field that's going over several hills, an old windmill up on top of the hill, beautiful clouds in the background. And so naturally there's so much going on here that I like, the tendency is to shoot a little bit wide. Now, in this case, this was still from a considerable distance, so this happens to have been captured with a 150 millimeter lens, 
but I'm including a lot in the frame. I like what's in the frame. I like the photo, actually, but there's something to be said for trying to simplify the composition. And so, for example, getting a bit closer. So this is still with 150 millimeter focal length, but moving closer to the scene. And when I got there, of course, first I was disappointed because now a cloud has moved in such a way into a position where the canola field, those yellow flowers blanketing the hilltop, are cast in shadow. But that will fortunately, with scattered clouds, get improved soon enough as the clouds move out of the way and we get sun on that hillside again. But in the meantime, I notice that the windmill that is more or less silhouetted against that big puffy cloud in the background, that nice cumulus cloud in the background, actually looks pretty interesting and it's caught my eye. And so just zooming in here, going to a 350 millimeter focal length to tighten up that composition to simplify the overall scene. Now, that's not to say that we should always simplify the scene once again. So here at the Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta, obviously colorful hot air balloons up in the sky. I really enjoyed photographing these subjects, and I actually really like this photograph. But that said, I feel that maybe there's a chance for a little more impact with simplicity. It's not that I'm ever going to think about deleting this photo or that I wouldn't share this photo. It's all just about context. But taking that same scene and then looking for a little simpler composition of focusing on a single hot air balloon, essentially filling the frame here, I have the benefit of complementary colors as well, yellow versus blue, opposite colors, and so that works very nicely also. And so the idea is just to look for other compositions within the scene. Speaking of looking for other compositions in the scene, this is actually something that I refer to as extraction, so extracting something out of a larger scene. And so with this photo, for example, a high vantage point on the island of Capri in Italy, looking down on Via Krupp, this walkway that goes all the way down toward the water on its way toward Marina Piccola. And the viewpoint is interesting. It gives you a sense of just how high up you are on the cliffs. But there's also sort of a lot going on here. And so taking a look at this scene and trying to figure out, is there something in there that I can extract, that I can pull out of the scene? And sure enough, one little area of that shoreline with the beautiful turquoise water and rocks, the rocky shore there, the shape of that shoreline I think is rather interesting. And so just extracting one element or one area out of that overall scene, just zooming in and finding something else. Uh, the funny thing, I've visited Capri more than a few times, and I usually try to exclude people from my photos. And so this is a spot that I visited more than once and have photographed more than once. And when I first saw the sunbather down there on the rocks just above the water, I thought, why does he have to be right there? And then I realized actually that kind of adds an interesting element to the scene. So I was happy that he was out there sunbathing. A similar scenario, this is at the Hubbard Glacier in Alaska. And, you know, another lesson, of course, is always to turn around and see what's behind you. I was so busy photographing the glacier, but fortunately took a look behind me, this really interesting mountain range. It was overcast, dreary sky. And, you know, naturally we tend to want nice bright light that gives us great contrast. But then I realized that, you know, the dreary sky and the mostly white, obviously there's the rock, the dark rock showing through, but the mountaintop covered in snow almost sort of not exactly disappears, but blends in a bit with that backdrop. And so I realized this was at a focal length of 256 millimeters. This was with a 150 to 600 millimeter lens. But if I could zoom in more now, that little crescent shape up toward the top left of the mountain range, that's what really caught my eye and I thought looked nice. And so I zoomed in all the way to 600 millimeters and came away with this extraction. Again, this sort of falls under that heading of simplicity, seeing if there's a way that I can simplify the overall composition so that the viewer has that one subject to react to, that sort of one element of the scene to focus their attention on and hopefully be wowed by. And on a similar note, looking for extractions, a lot of this is Sometimes, you know, what is it? Necessity is the mother of invention. And I personally tend to prefer not to have people or not too many people in my photos. And so when I get to a place where there's lots of people, now I'm trying to figure out what can I do uh, 
to not have people in my photo, and that sometimes leads to abstract photos, where I'm essentially either extracting an element of the scene or I'm looking for a different perspective. Where can I point my lens that'll still be interesting but without people? So here, this happens to be a building. This is the PATH station. It's a shopping mall. This is a building right near the World Trade Center in New York City, and it's got a really interesting shape on the outside. I like the inside even more, and so exploring around and finding these abstract textures and patterns formed by you know, what are essentially like columns supporting the structure, and so finding these elements within a scene, another extraction, but where it's abstract. So I'm in this case, really focus primarily on trying to not have people in the photo. And so in the case of the interior of the building, tilting that lens upward, using a wide angle lens and getting this sort of geometric pattern, literally from just tilting upward in order to exclude people from the photo. And so this is sort of one of those making lemonade out of lemons type of scenario where I was really just trying to find an angle that would not include people, and as a result, came away with a composition that I liked a lot more than other shots that would have included people, that would have included, even if there weren't any people in the building at the time, I still like this sort of abstract interpretation of the building. And speaking of which, going outside, this is right next door to the World Trade Center, and so going along one of the sides of the building, the World Trade Center, and having the sort of bevels along the side, almost like facets, so that if you go on the straight, if you go right against the edge of the building, the broad side, if you will, of the building, looking straight up, it sort of forms this pyramid, which also is kind of an abstract interpretation of a building. Now then I also like to try to balance. You know, a lot of this extracting or creating abstracts is about isolating a key subject in part to simplify. And here I've been talking about what you might think of as sort of cropping compositionally. In other words, I'm adjusting the angle of view, the field of view, the way I'm cropping the scene in order to try to simplify or get something interesting. But that same thing comes into play in another dimension and that would be with depth of field, with focus. And so, for example, isolating a subject with focus. With a scene like this, once again, canola fields in the Palouse in Washington State, I want everything in focus. I want those canola flowers right in the foreground at the bottom of the frame to be in focus. And then I want the canola way off in the distance to be in focus. And I want the clouds to be in focus. And for a landscape type shot, that works wonderfully well. But, of course, at the same time, if I want to add another element of impact, then I might want to isolate with focus. So here the impact would be, in large part, color and texture, but then I can get a little closer and isolate a small area of the scene. In this case, one stalk of flowers, of those canola flowers in the field, and then isolate that stalk with focus. So using a narrow depth of field with a long lens, positioning some other flowers in the foreground so we get that color wash. And then, of course, the flowers off in the distance in the background become a color wash as well. So it becomes sort of this clean canvas so that I can have just my primary subject set against the clean canvas, if you will, that just color wash in both, you might say, the foreground and the background with the primary subject in between. And then a variation on that is not just isolating with focus, which obviously involves a degree of narrow depth of field, but actually just focusing on narrow depth of field. And one thing that I try to do periodically is to sort of give myself an exercise, if you will, to force myself to think more about a particular facet of photography, a particular element of creativity. And so... Sometimes I just naturally say, you know what, I want to capture this subject with narrow depth of field. In other cases, I'll actually intentionally go out looking for scenes that I can interpret with narrow depth of field, or even just not even necessarily looking for subjects that work well with narrow depth of field. And this is just as one example. I could choose a variety of different topics here. But forcing myself, okay, today is kind of narrow depth of field day. So this is one of my favorite streets. It's along one of my favorite streets to photograph in New York City. I take my groups here all the time when I'm leading photo workshops here. And 
I had decided I had a lens that opens up to f1.8. I could get really narrow depth of field. In this case, it happens to be a 35 millimeter lens. And so then I used only that lens, only at f1.8, in order to sort of force myself to have some time of just photographing with narrow depth of field. And I find that these sort of artificial limitations that we might place on ourselves can be very helpful in terms of exercising your creativity, forcing you to think a little bit more creatively, to look at your surroundings a little bit differently. And so I would wander up and down a few blocks of this street in the in Greenwich Village, the Greenwich Village neighborhood of New York City, and make a point of seeking out, in this case, narrow depth of field. And again, you could choose virtually any other limitation. It could be lots of depth of field or a specific focal length or whatever the case might be, forcing yourself to limit what you're going to do photographically and then try and figure out, okay, now how can I apply that in this given scenario, in this location, for example. And same thing, in this case, not an exercise. It was just sort of, I guess, the mood I was in. I do personally like narrow depth of field quite a lot. And out in the Palouse, there was a woman who had this wonderful English garden of flowers, just amazing. And it rained, and so we were looking for what can we do when it's raining, and it's not necessarily a scenario where we want to photograph landscapes. Well, let's go photograph flowers and get some close-ups of flowers. And so, not exactly macro, but close-up photography in any event where getting a lot of depth of field could be a challenge, but not impossible. But here, once again, choosing to go with a more narrow depth of field because it adds an element of mystery, almost, you might say, for the photo, where we're essentially changing the perspective. This is not the way we normally experience the world with this narrow depth of field. I mean, in reality, we do have narrow depth of field with our vision. We just don't realize it because of the way our brain is blending all of this visual information together and how we're adjusting our focus as we move our eyes around a scene. But this does give a unique view on a subject, I think. And of course, in some cases, it's more about kind of just paying attention. It's not about what camera settings you're using necessarily, but about being observant and seeking out things that have impact sort of just by their nature. And one of those is contrast. And so just looking for contrast, and this is funny, this set of shutters on the window, nice looking building, nice color contrast, and also nice light contrast. I mean, we've got a well-lit scene with some strong shadows. And this is in Bologna, Italy. We had driven near Bologna. We had driven on the highway past Bologna many times, but never stopped in. I sort of figured, eh, it's just a big city. And then on one of the trips, finally decided, you know, I've never been actually in the Bologna and checked it out. And so let's give it a shot. And I actually really grew to like Bologna quite a lot. And so wandering around the central part of town, well, of the city, and noticed this subject. And it was really the contrast that caught my eye. And I think of course, this is yet another example, relatively speaking, of simplicity, but it also has nice contrast. And so whenever I see nice, strong lighting, and especially, you know, I know there's the old mantra that you never photograph at high noon, because that's, I guess, when photographers are supposed to take a nap after having gotten up for sunrise. And that sounds like a really good idea when I've gotten up for sunrise. But the, the notion that you can't capture great photos at high noon, I think, is a little bit silly. And very often, because of that harsh, strong light, you can get some wonderful contrast that really works very nicely for a scene. And so, actually seeking out, paying attention for contrast, looking for scenarios where you can get good contrast and then trying to make the most of it. And part of that contrast is shadows. So, sort of funny, you know, I was talking about that windmill up atop the canola field on the hills, and that by the time I'd gotten closer, the sun had gotten hidden by another cloud, and so there was shadow cast across the landscape. Shadows, though, can work wonderfully well as long as you have some light to contrast with those shadows. And so I find very often that shadows make the photo. You know, we are, of course, photographing light. We're capturing or documenting light and the interaction of light on our subjects. But it's really the shadows, it's the dark areas that help to define and to emphasize the light that caught our eye in the first place. 
And so once again, back out in the Palouse, you see scattered clouds in the sky. And whenever there's scattered clouds, and especially if it's reasonably windy, especially high-level winds, so that the clouds are moving relatively quickly, I get really, really excited. Because that means that the clouds from those from the, the clouds going across the landscape are going to generate shadows, of course. And those shadows are going to move across the landscape. And so if you time your shot right, if you wait for those clouds to make their appearance, you can get some really fun results. And so anybody who's ever been on a workshop with me out in the Palouse knows probably that if there's shadows dancing across the landscape, that I'm going to get very excited and start squealing a bit. And, and when there's another shadow on its way, I'll be yelling out that there's a shadow making its way across the hills. Get ready. And if you can get that shot timed well so that we've got not just shadow, of course, but light and shadow, the shadow helping to emphasize the light. So here, for example, in the rolling Palouse, these hills, these essentially sand dunes of topsoil, that they're harvesting, you know, growing wheat and garbanzo beans and lentils and a variety of other crops, including the canola we saw earlier in this presentation, those rolling hills are incredible. And when you've got light and shadow contrasting, it really can help to emphasize the contours of those hills. But more importantly is that that contrast really creates an element of that wow factor, where there's just this immediate intense look to the photo in terms of the distinction between the foreground and that background, the light and the shadow, and especially if it's relatively strong contrast, very dark shadows with bright highlights in the foreground, it can create a tremendous impact in the photo, much more than the previous photo there where we've just got nice sunlight, no shadows, and so the contours of the hills really are not being emphasized, but as soon as a nice shadow rolls into the right position, then we've got a really, I think, more interesting photograph, a photograph that has more impact. I'll also, in many cases, and this is another one of those things that I feel like sort of comes in fits and starts. I think one of the biggest challenges as a photographer is to sort of always have an awareness of what the possibilities are. And so, for example, adding a blur. I find that I tend to sort of get into blur mode and then I get into non-blur mode. In other words, I'm using relatively long exposures, and it might be a couple hours, or it might be a day, it might be a few days, where I'm just constantly paying attention to what sort of opportunities might exist for a slightly long exposure to get a blur effect. And then other times, of course, I'll maybe just realize, oh, here's flowing water. I know it's a little bit cliche, but flowing water extending that exposure a little bit using a neutral density filter or if the light's not too strong maybe even just stopping down the lens to the minimum aperture size the largest f number and getting an exposure that's reasonably long more often than not i tend not to take those exposures too long because i still in many cases want the texture so with flowing water in particular i want a long exposure to get this kind of silky wispy effect but i don't want it to be such a long exposure that the water sort of just becomes uh, almost completely solid blur, meaning that there's no texture whatsoever. So finding the right balance, which of course depends on how fast that water is flowing, but adding that blur effect, again, because this is not the way that we experience the world. We tend to see, more often than not, or at least perceive, that the detail is rendered nice and sharp and that the motion is frozen. We don't really get an opportunity with our eyes to freeze that motion with a blur effect. We might get a sense that things are moving, but we don't see the textures that are created by a still photo with a somewhat long exposure. And so that adds a unique element that I think can really wow the viewer as well. And another, you know, I talked about contrast earlier and that sometimes comes into play in terms of the angle from which we view a subject. And so in many cases, backlighting can work very nicely. When I'm out with photographers and the sun angle is relatively low, meaning the sun is somewhat low in the sky, it's either relatively early in the morning or late afternoon, I will encourage the photographers to, whenever possible, sort of almost circle around the subject so that you can see the impact of that subject with different lighting angles. 
And so side lighting often works very nicely because it will give us nice contrast and texture. It'll emphasize the texture. Of course, we very often like direct lighting, meaning that the sun or the light source is behind us over our shoulder. And so it's illuminating that subject head on and we're getting to see all of the detail of that subject. But backlighting can work wonderfully well also. And so here, for example, with a wheat field, we have the shadow in the background because the sun is getting so low that the hill off in the background is it cast in shadow. But then the wheat in the foreground is being illuminated. And one of the great things about wheat is that it has this beard that serves, it almost acts like a filament and it just glows with light when you get that backlighting. And so then once again, contrast, once again, shadow. So you'll see how many of these concepts sort of overlap or we, where we can use more than one of these various concepts in order to add greater impact for our photos. And so here, a relatively straightforward example of backlighting plus contrast, plus the use of shadows to emphasize the bright areas, but then also simplifying or extracting a detail from the scene. So this overall scene is nice, but then I'll start exploring a little closer to the field and looking for some stalks of wheat that are just a little bit higher than the surrounding area and then finding another way of interpreting that same subject in a very different way. Both, I think, are very nice, but to me personally, the backlighting has an impact, but the simplifying of the overall composition or extracting an element of the scene also adds impact. And so to me, if we can combine multiple of these ingredients, if you will, we can add increasing amounts of impact and create a photo that hopefully will wow the viewer more than if we had only used a single of these ingredients. I also, you know, of course, the play of light can be so wonderful, light and shadows, but there's all sorts of ways that we can observe light and record light in our photos. And one of those is to focus on reflections. And so finding where we get light reflecting off of a shiny surface, that often for me, means water because I love any opportunity I can to get close to water. Here, of course, many of you might be familiar with some of the colors on the water. This is in Venice, Italy. Some beautifully, vibrantly colored, painted buildings with oftentimes contrasting or complementary colors. And so naturally, when you see a building that's so colorful, you're going to want to photograph the building. But then I noticed how wonderful the reflections were and I made the reflections themselves be the key subject, or you might say that the color is the key subject, or the texture is the key subject, but all of that was made possible by the actual reflections on the surface of the water. And so I find that oftentimes incorporating reflections, it's just, there's something magical about the reflection on the surface of water, for example. And so I find myself photographing water very, very often when there's nice clouds in the sky or color from buildings or boats being reflected onto that water. Getting out onto the water. I was in Austria in the small town of Hallstatt in the Alps and got out on a small boat, partly because I was just struggling with how do I photograph this small town in a way that's interesting. A small town of a thousand people perched on a lakefront with the Alps rising, it seemed almost vertically, directly behind the town. And I was struggling with finding a composition that sort of contained all of that. And then I realized if I got out on the water, it might be a lot easier. And sure enough, getting out on the water made it a lot easier to find a composition that I was happy with for that little town. And really what made the shot, or really what inspired me to capture the shot, or what finally got the message across to my brain that here is a photo because once I got out on a boat, I was still struggling a little bit in terms of trying to find the right angle. And it wasn't until I got a little further away from shore and was just enjoying the view and realized those reflections are wonderful. And so I captured a photo that really was emphasizing the reflections. You can see that I've got the the scene here split roughly into, you could say the horizon, so to speak, is roughly at the center of the frame. 
Part of that, I suppose, was indecision because I couldn't decide what's more important, the town with a little bit of reflection or the reflections with a little bit of town. So I went for half and half, which is not what I would typically do. We're all supposed to obey the rule of thirds for every photo, right? But it's not always the right answer. And so here trying to balance the reflections plus the town, and I thought it just worked out very nicely. I was very happy with the photo, very happy with the experience. But it really was made possible because of those reflections on the water. And sometimes you'll get lucky enough that you can mix, as I mentioned before, different of these elements. And so mixing the reflections with, for example, backlighting. This was another experience. I would love to say that every photo that I have that I'm proud of was uh, a moment of genius. An instantaneous moment of genius where I had this brilliant idea right from the start and I executed that idea perfectly. But more often than not, that's not the case. I, sometimes it seems that many of my favorite photos were a result of a series of happy accidents or that I you know, was focusing on the wrong thing. And that's exactly what happened here with this uh, snowy egret. I was photographing in Florida at Ding Darling and there were a number of birds kind of off in this shadow area. And of course, they were feeding they were doing this dance on the water where they're sort of flitting about very gracefully and delicately performing this ballet routine as they grab shrimp and fish out of the water. But they were doing all of this in the, the shadow of these shrubs right near the shore. And it was so frustrating because I'm using, if I remember correctly, this was with a 500 millimeter focal length. And I'm on a tripod and I'm trying to, you know, get everything to come together properly, trying to follow these birds, which are moving relatively quickly, all things considered. But they're also in the shadows. It's right about sunrise. The sun's just coming up over the horizon. And I'm getting frustrated. And then I realize that all of the activity that I'm focusing on, the photo that I think I want is in the shadows. But then once a bird gets a fish or two or a you know, shrimp or two, it's had its full, at least for the moment, then it would fly off to my left, from right to left, and sort of head off into the distance a little bit. And as it would do so, I realized that the rising sun was back behind the bird. So if I would have just followed through, all the activity that I thought I wanted to photograph was happening in one area, but the real shot ultimately ended up being as the bird was leaving the shot that I thought I wanted and then coming out, getting essentially between me and the sun that was rising. So it cast beautiful colored reflections, just reflections of the color of the sunrise, these sort of pastel, almost purple sort of tones and backlighting, which not only illuminated the feather detail, especially of the wings, but also cast the water's texture onto the, if you will, the foreground wing, the bird's left wing. And so to me, it just was this magical moment that I captured a photo that I'm very happy with, and yet I deserve almost none of the credit because it was really a matter of me being totally focused on the wrong photo and then finally realizing, oh, wait, here's another shot that actually was better than anything else that I would have captured if I hadn't been paying attention as these birds were leaving their little snack area. And I mentioned, by the way, the rule of thirds that I broke in the previous photo. Here again, breaking the rule of thirds because I didn't give the bird uh, room to move, room in front of it, but that was really intentional. I have another shot that is very similar, but where there is space in front of the bird. But I really liked the ripples of the water, the, the rings on the water from the bird having reached down into that water. And so, to me, breaking the rule of thirds here also worked very nicely, at least I'm happy with it. And it's funny because so often I'll find that the circumstances where I'm almost a little bit frustrated because I'm not getting the conditions just the way I want them, or I, you know, the birds are not cooperating and flying in the area where I want them to be, they're not feeding out in the nice light, for example. But sometimes when I'm not getting what I think I want, I end up getting something that's even better. And so, for example, once again, out in the Palouse, when we get up to the top of Steptoe Butte, the view is just spectacular. The challenge, though, is that, if you'll recall, those hills that you see going off for as far as you can see are essentially sand dunes of topsoil. 
And of course, it's an agricultural area, so very often you'll find that there's going to be a farmer plowing a field, and that will kick up dust, and sometimes it's breezy, and that will kick up dust, and sometimes it's just hazy because of moisture in the air. And anytime we go up to the top of Steptoe, I generally, at least in theory, would rather have clear conditions so that we really get a nice, beautiful view off into the distance. And so if we get up there and it's a little hazier than we expected, sometimes I feel like almost a little disappointed because I wanted that beautiful, clear view for as far as you can possibly see. And yet, when it's hazy, in some respects, the hazier the better, because then as the sun starts to get low in the sky, you'll very often get wonderful color as the sun is essentially backlighting all of that haze, and you'll get some color as a result. Essentially, sunset colors spreading across the landscape because of the way that haze is capturing the light. And so, while haze is something I very often wish were not there, it can also be used to tremendous advantage. I had a similar experience in the South Pacific. I was on the island of Tahiti looking back at, I believe this was Morea, and the sunset was just glorious. But in large part, that was a matter, not even so much of the sunset per se, or clouds at the horizon, but just that my view back toward the setting sun, or the sun that was getting close to setting, was through all of this haze that I might otherwise, in different circumstances, say, I sure wish the haze wasn't there so I could get a more clear shot of this beautiful landscape. But in actual fact, with the sun going down, backlighting all of this haze, getting that light scattered, getting that wonderful golden color in the haze, the haze really essentially made the shot. Thank goodness it was hazy. So, you know, again, making lemonade out of lemons when the circumstances don't seem to be completely perfect, when they're not exactly what you thought you wanted, see if there are some other ways that you can work with that scene so that you can come away with a great photo, even if those conditions weren't exactly what you were expecting. Now, some of that, of course, what you were expecting is a matter of research and planning, and this is one of the things, when I'm leading a photo workshop, I might seem calm on the outside, but on the inside, I'm usually stressing out about whether or not the conditions will work out the way we want them, and whether or not the timing will work out the way I want it to, so that we can get the shot that we're after. And so when I have a photo, a location that I want to take the group to, it often, or at least in many cases, it's best at a particular time. And so then, if we're you know, if we've got plenty of time until whatever that time might be, for example, sunset, then we might explore around a couple of other areas before we get to the shot that I had in mind for maybe sunset. So what time is sunset? And where will the sunset? What will the angle be? And so doing a little bit of research and figuring out what your angles might be so that when you have the group of photographers climb to the top of Spanish Steps, and turn around to look back on the heart of Rome, being able to have a lovely scene that potentially includes the sun. And I find that very often just including the sun in the frame can add impact to that photo. Sunsets, it's sort of funny because I always joke around with photographers when we're talking about photographing a sunset. If you're like me, and I think many, many photographers, you can't resist a good sunset and you can't resist photographing a sunset. But I often feel like, in the end, that photo is just a sunset. So in including the sun doesn't always make a photo, but it can certainly add a wow factor to a scene. And so in Rome, I, there's a number of vantage points that I really like where we're able to get these domes, these clock towers, steeples, etc., a cluster of them grouped together. And that by itself can be interesting, but then great lighting, backlighting, potentially including the sun in the frame, can make that photo all that much more interesting, can make the experience of being there that much more magical, but then also with the sun in the frame, it makes that photo, I think, a bit more impactful. Not just because the sun is in the frame, also because we've got good color, we've got backlighting, we've got good contrast, but the sun in the frame also, I think, adds an interesting element. And so very often, I will seek out scenes 
you could think of these, I suppose, in large part as sunset scenes or sunrise scenes or just circumstances where we're able to include the sun in the frame in an interesting way. I know it's a bit cliche, but one of the things that I like to do when I'm including the sun in the frame, as long as it's not too hazy, is to stop down the lens, to use a relatively small lens aperture, stopping down to f16 or f22, so that you get a starburst effect with the sun, so you get those rays coming out, in this case with the sun. Obviously this would work also with a relatively sharp light source, in other words a, non, a light source that doesn't have a diffuser around it. And so including the sun in the frame I think can really add impact where the viewer looks and says, oh wow. Because after all, I think who doesn't enjoy a good sunset? And so if you can capture a good sunset or a good sunrise, including the sun in the frame, I think that can add a really interesting element to a photo. And then once you've got that sun in the frame, then you might decide to block the sun from the frame, putting a subject in between you and the sun, for example, in order to create a silhouette. So again, including sort of, in this case, the sun in the frame, reflections on some level, backlighting, color, but then also creating a circumstance, a scenario, or adjusting your exposure settings such that you can create a silhouette where there's very little detail in your key subject. They're just cast against a hopefully beautiful, colorful, bright, vibrant backdrop. And then of course the sun sets and it's time to go home. Or maybe not, because as I'm sure many of you are well aware, quite often what happens after the sunset is sometimes much better, much more interesting photographically than the actual sunset or even the late afternoon light that happens before sunset. And so that for me would be blue hour. And you know, funny, my favorite blue hour shot happened quite by accident. I'm starting to realize that many of my favorite photos in part stemmed from accidents or from me not getting the photo that I thought I wanted and instead coming away with a photo I liked even more. So this was on our last night in Florence, Italy. It had been raining for a couple of days. This was my last chance to get this photo that I had in mind. My thought was that if we get up to this piazza at right about sunset, I could photograph the Duomo at the heart of Florence right at sunset and it would be spectacular and wonderful. It would have tremendous impact. And I do think that photo could have had tremendous impact except I never got that photo because as you can see, there was quite a bit of cloud out toward the horizon. And so the sunset kind of just never happened. The sunlight just fizzled. So it seemed like I wasn't going to get the photo that I was hoping for. Fortunately, though, I stuck around and waited a little bit longer. And after the sun got below the horizon and the light started to fade more and more, blue hour arrived and I was able to photograph that Duomo with blue hour, with you know this wonderful blue color in the sky and the hills behind. You can see the shadows in the foreground even a little bit blue. And thanks to the lights that are illuminating the Duomo, it almost has that kind of daylight appearance, even though everything else around it is cast in that wonderful blue hour light as the light is fading and fading. And so I find that as much as I love incorporating the sun in the frame and photographing sunset and late afternoon light, sometimes blue hour can be even more magical and interesting. Here's in Rome a variation on that concept. St. Peter's Basilica, a little bit after sunset, and the sky, you know, clear blue sky, wonderful blue hour, and really, I think with the somewhat yellow illumination, the lights illuminating the basilica, color contrast, the complementary color compared to that blue hour sky, I think it just works uh, works out wonderfully in this case, and so wonderful to experience as well. And so again, remembering that sticking around after the sunset can be very helpful photographically in terms of getting some great shots. And I guess sort of the opposite of that would be beating the sun, getting up before sunrise. That is something that I don't very often do intentionally. It's generally quite by accident. For example, we had traveled to Sardinia, which involved, in this case, a ferry ride, which happens to be an overnight ferry ride. And so you arrive in Sardinia before the sun is even up. And so after getting off the ferry, 
and seeing wonderful mountains with the sun getting ready to come up behind them, there was incredible color up in the sky. The sun not yet up to the horizon, but starting to get somewhat close where we're starting to get a little bit of that color, the oranges at the horizon, but still sort of that blue hour light up at the top of the sky. So while I'm not very often motivated to get up well before the sun rises above the horizon, I do find that very often when I'm up before sunrise, it is a tremendously rewarding experience. And sometimes if I'm lucky, that also translates into some photos that I'm very happy with. Now, I talked about the sun in several contexts here, but I think it's also worth keeping in mind that the moon can be a very interesting subject. And I do find that very often the moon can add a bit of impact to a photo. So once again in Italy, in this case, once again, Rome, and there's a hilltop out toward the, well, not hill, out to the west of Rome that gives you a wonderful vantage point over the heart of Rome. It's one of my favorite places to go and enjoy late afternoon, especially bring a sandwich and have a little picnic up there, for example, and just enjoy the light as it transitions. But all by itself, unless you get really good light on the city as the sun's getting low in the sky, that's not going to be a photo all by itself. You need something else to add some element of interest to the scene. And fortunately, during our photo workshop last year, the timing worked out well that there would be a full moon during the workshop. And so I used the Photographer's Ephemeris, which is an app for smartphones as well as a website that you can use to see the path, as it were, of the sun and the moon at sunrise and sunset, for example, at a given location on a given date. And so I knew the date of the full moon, and I knew that I was going to be in Rome, so I could use the photographer's ephemeris to browse the map and see the angle to the moon at the time of the moonrise. And so I could position that line, position the anchor for that line around on the map and find vantage points that would work well. And it turned out that this hilltop would work out very nicely in terms of having the moon rise over the heart of Rome, essentially the view that you're looking at right now. But then when the sun sets and the full moon starts to rise, then we've got what I think is a more interesting photo. And it's sort of funny. I was thinking about this earlier today, knowing that this photo was in this presentation. And I was thinking, you know, the scene, the view by itself the photograph isn't necessarily the most impactful photograph, just the view. And just the full moon in the sky, it's interesting, I like it, but it's not necessarily the most impactful photo all by itself, just the moon in the sky. So these two elements taken separately are not necessarily the most interesting elements that I could include in a photograph. But combining them together, I sort of feel like, you know, the sum is greater, no, what is, what's the saying about the, greater than the sum of its parts? Whatever that saying is, insert that here, because I feel like just the moon would not be all that impactful, and just Rome viewed from this vantage point is not necessarily that impactful, but the two combined, I think, are rather impactful, or at least I like the impact of those elements in this particular scenario, in this particular photograph. But then, of course, there's more to photography than just the photography. There's the way we interpret those photos in post-processing. And so I want to share just a few tips about things you might think about when you're optimizing your photos in the computer after the capture. And one of those is just to optimize contrast. In large part, this is about a good exposure from the start. And a lot of this is about setting your white point and your black point. As a very general rule, setting the white point so that the brightest pixels in the image are white or very close to white, and setting your black point so that the darkest pixels are black or very nearly black. That's not always the right answer, but it works a really good percentage of the time, I think. And so finding a way to optimize contrast, not taking it too far, but as I've talked about with several examples today, sometimes contrast or shadows can really add an element of interest to an image. And so optimizing that contrast in post-processing can help to draw out just the right amount of detail, just the right amount of contrast to add impact to the photo. And a lot of this is sort of thinking about what kind of impact I want a photo to have. 
Here, the impact is in large part about textures and contrast, and of course contrast enhances texture, as well as color. We have sort of some primary colors, maybe not any red, but we've got green and blue there. We've got texture in the wheat field, we've got texture in the sky, and so optimizing the contrast in order to add to that impact. Now, sometimes we want the opposite. The impact is the subtlety of the scene or of the image or the subtlety of color. So we're not always looking for as much impact, as much contrast as possible, but trying to find the right balance and be thoughtful about how we want to present the scene, how we want to interpret the scene, both in terms of how we photograph that scene, but also in terms of how we adjust the appearance of the photo, how we optimize the photo in post-processing. And of course, as I mentioned, color can be some of that impact. So boosting the color, increasing saturation, but doing that wisely, doing that with a little bit of self-control. And that's where vibrance comes in. If you use Lightroom or Camera Raw and some other tools as well, Photoshop, we have a vibrance adjustment, which I often describe as saturation with built-in self-control. And the idea is we want to boost the colors to make that scene look the way it really looked to our eye. Very often, as with this photo that we're looking at here, the colors, when they come out of the camera, don't look like what we saw in the scene. Now, sometimes that just means you need to darken up the exposure a little bit so that you're retaining more of the density of that color information. In other words, not blowing out the highlights, even if it's just on one color channel. But also, we might need to boost those colors in post because we're, we do have a little bit of a flatness, especially with raw captures. And so here, with just a little bit of a boost of vibrance to get those colors back to the way they actually appeared to me or the way I remember them looking, in some cases maybe pushing it a little bit further than reality so that it's more what we wished it had looked like, but not taking it so far that those colors look artificial and that we're you know, kind of taking away from the photo. So just adding to that impact where the viewer says, wow, that's some lovely color. It's not this sort of ridiculous saturation that's going over the top. It's just sort of these pastel colors getting that golden light that the sun as it was getting close to setting was casting across the scene. And then also I talked about haze earlier and how haze can be helpful but sometimes haze just adds a sort of drab quality to a photo. And so when the dehaze adjustment became available, and it is available in Camera Raw, if you're a Photoshop user in Lightroom or in Photoshop Elements, there's a haze reduction feature where we can reduce that haze. We can take that haze and sort of cut through it. So here's the image without any haze reduction and then using not too much, but a little bit of dehaze in order to cut back on that scattering of light. In this case, uh, close to a backlit scenario, the sun is not so low that I'm getting that amazing color closer to sunset that we saw with a couple of the photos previously, but cutting back on what haze is there. It's not giving us any magical color, and so I might prefer to cut back on the haze and get more of that contrast and texture in the scene. And so I do find when dehaze first became available in Lightroom, and I tested it for the first time, it was just this wow moment. And so that adjustment really can add an element of wow or impact to a photo, helping to enhance contrast, and in many cases the color as well, as sort of a byproduct of that haze reduction. And then, you know, with that dehaze enhancing texture in the scene, very often I find that part of what drew me to a scene was the texture, but then if I'm capturing a color image, that texture suddenly doesn't stand out very well. And so we've got a photo where it just kind of becomes a blah. It's not exactly what we maybe interpreted or envisioned that scene being when we captured the photo in the first place or when we first found the subject. And so here, one of my favorite doors to photograph in Rome, and obviously it's mostly about the texture, but in large part, I think the color sort of detracts from the image. We've got some rust in there and there's kind of greenish elements from one of the many layers of paint that has been applied to this door. And so I just feel that the color was taking away from that subject that I photographed. And so converting to black and white so that we can enhance that texture. In some respects, it's really more about removing a distracting element and instead focusing the viewer only on the texture and the texture, of course, then becomes 
you might even say the key subject. And here with a shadow casting across part of the scene, that shadow also helps to emphasize that play of light. And I think that works very nicely as well. So again, coming back to that idea of taking more than one of these various ingredients and combining them together to try to improve and increase the overall impact of a photo. And then trying to make sure that our adjustments match the mood of the scene. So it's not just what is it that caught your eye about that scene. So here, the in large part, the thing that caught my eye was the texture of this subject. But then what about the mood? And so here, this is a photo I captured a long time ago in Tokyo, Japan. And I was sort of, I thought it was going to be a great photo when I captured it, but I was sort of frustrated when I got back to my computer. It just didn't have the impact that the experience had when I was there in the first place. And so I tried to figure out adjustments that would match the mood of the experience. And there was this sort of timeless element and this mysterious element. And so I applied a variety of adjustments, converting to black and white, adding a color tint for a sepia tone type of effect, adding a vignette to add contrast and a little bit of drama, a little bit of mystery, and the result was something that I was much happier with in terms of the impact of the photo. And so trying to think, you know, again, this recurring theme of I didn't get exactly what I thought I was getting. I didn't get the photo that I was expecting to get necessarily. But then there was a different answer. There was a different solution to that problem, if you will. And so in situations where I didn't get the conditions I wanted. Sometimes I still get photos that I'm very happy with. And in situations where I thought I got the photo, but then I didn't, I can apply some post-processing and, you know, get that to go a little bit into a different direction that possibly in some cases works very nicely as well. And so just trying to be thoughtful. And a lot of this comes from practice and comes from being thoughtful when you're out photographing and thoughtful when you're optimizing after the fact, but trying to figure out ways that you can, you know, kind of focus on impact a little bit, focus on adding a little bit of wow to that scene. Sometimes that's by removing an element, sometimes it's adding an element. So removing distractions, for example, finding an angle that works better, waiting for a shadow to appear, whatever the case might be, trying to wow your viewers with your photos by adding more impact to those photos. Now, I do have a few questions here. If you've got questions or comments, feel free to put those into the questions field here in the webinar platform, and I'll be happy to get to some of those here. I do want to mention, by the way, once again, thank you to Tamron for sponsoring this webinar presentation, the entire Gray Learning webinar series. And in fact, Richard asked if I could post the education website that I mentioned at the beginning. And yes, indeed, that is Tamron's YouTube channel. And so if you go to youtube.com, slash Tamron, T-A-M-R-O-N, vids, as in video, V-I-D-S. So youtube.com slash Tamron vids, and that will get you to the Tamron channel on YouTube. And as part of that, that series that focuses on a single photographer in a single location using a single lens to learn a lesson. Uh, very, very interesting series, which I will soon be featured in. I'll let you know about that in a future update. Uh, and Sam asks, if I ever angle my camera to get a skewed view of a subject, and yes, absolutely, I do indeed. Uh, I will put a building sort of off kilter. I will intentionally rotate my camera just a little bit. And it's a great point uh, that Sam brings up because yes, indeed, that skewed angle, just photographing a subject at an angle that is sort of not the quote unquote right angle, not the appropriate angle. So for example, with the Flatiron Building, I'm sure many of you are familiar with in New York City, it's this, uh, the footprint of it is triangular in shape. And so you get a very interesting perspective on the building, but sometimes tilting the camera to put the quote unquote wrong angle at a horizontal or a vertical can actually work very nicely. So a great question, a great tip in terms of finding that sort of skewed angle sometimes works nicely. Sometimes I find that by accident because I'm trying to get people out of the frame. Uh, and sometimes it's a thoughtful uh, element in terms of making sure that I'm being thoughtful about what other possibilities exist. And so just finding, oh, here's an interesting angle that works nicely. And then Alice asks about the backlighting 
situation? How do you get rid of noise? And there's a couple of things there. One, I mentioned right from the start, exposing to the right. So exposing as bright as possible without losing detail on any of your channels, ideally, so that you have more information and less noise. Also making sure that you're photographing in the raw mode so that you have a higher bit depth. Very often what we might think of as sort of noise is really a loss of smooth gradations of tone and color in the scene and that is posterization having a higher bit depth. So shooting in JPEG with a very high contrast scene will often be problematic and cause you to lose some of that uh, detail, that smoothness of texture transitions. And then also making sure not to apply very strong contrast enhancements in post-processing. Uh, so Keith says, when the masters painted, their work with color choice can be pivotal, or was pivotal, I guess we could say. Uh, not just complementary colors, but other more subtle combinations. How can we do that in photography with and without post-processing uh, so that the color doesn't get too random and subject to luck, which I've addressed more than once today, my lucky scenarios when I was able to get a shot. And it's a great question in terms of painting. I often joke about how painters have it easy because they get to create an idealized version of a scene that they're, they're creating, if you will, whereas a photographer has to sort of dealt deal with the cards that uh, that they're dealt, uh, so work with the cards they're dealt. And it means we have less flexibility. Of course, uh, then the punchline is that the painters have to actually be able to paint that scene versus just pressing a button on the camera. But I think part of this is just being observant, so finding the right color situations, finding the right, you know, subject to put into the foreground, for example. Uh, let's say you're, you know, at a waterfront and you've got this beautiful golden hour, then you might look for some complementary colors or which isn't always opposite colors, by the way, as, as he pointed out in his question, but is just a color that complements well. And there's a variety of different uh, relationships, you might say, with color triads and whatnot, where those different combinations work nicely. But seeking out a scenario, a subject that will work well in terms of those complementary colors, and then a degree of post-processing. Some of that, for example, is just shifting the hue of individual colors so it gets closer to a pleasing color or color that works well with the scene. And so again, some of that is just being observant with the scene, and some of that is careful post-processing to emphasize colors, and not always using these more linear adjustments, so temperature and tint, for example, but diving into those individual color adjustments with the HSL availability. So being able to shift the hue of individual colors and shift the saturation of individual colors. I see Kathy wants to know if the webinar will be available for viewing again, and I love that that question came during the presentation because it tells me, I hope, that you enjoyed the presentation, Kathy. And yes, indeed, we will get this published by virtue of registering for today's webinar. You'll get a follow-up email. We will publish the presentation, the recording, on my YouTube channel, the Tim Gray TV YouTube channel, uh, later on today. So you'll be able to watch it as many times as you'd like. And I encourage you to do exactly that. Uh, great question from Lois. Uh, when photographing the sun, where do you focus? And and also mentions exposure there. So if the sun's in the frame, very often you're going to, if you're just metering the overall scene, going to need to underexpose or apply minus exposure compensation of about one to two stops, depending on what the overall scene is looking like, how much light's reflected, etc. And then focus is going to be on the you know, foreground or the key subject area. It depends obviously on what your subject is and whether it's a you know broad landscape versus an individual subject etc but the key point being not focusing out at infinity not trying to focus on the sun but focusing on your foreground element and then let's see here uh, nick asks is the pre-sunrise light different from post-sunset light in your experience it seems to me that the sky is clearer earlier and it's a great point because yes, the atmospheric conditions do tend to be a little bit different, sunrise versus sunset, in large part because of atmospheric conditions. And a lot of that relates to evaporation. And so with the night being cooler, generally speaking, most of the time than the daytime, during the day you tend to get a lot more in the way of evaporation. So you tend to have more moisture in the air. And as it cools, as the air cools at night, then we get that saturation, the, the water tends to be sort of squeezed out, 
the moisture tends to be squeezed out of the air, and so we get less visible humidity. Uh, well, sometimes you get more because you've cooled down to the dew point, and so you create fog, for example. But very often you'll find that there's less haze in the atmosphere when it's cooler, meaning at sunrise as opposed to sunset. And so there is a difference. Obviously, in many respects, they're the same because a sunrise is just a sunset in reverse and vice versa. But based on atmospheric conditions and other factors, there is very often a considerable dif difference between those two experiences and therefore the photo. And so as much as I, I don't mind staying up for sunset, getting up for sunrise can be a bit more of a challenge, but there is value in doing both because you do get different qualities of light, different atmospheric conditions very often at sunrise versus sunset. All right, so that's all the time we have for today. We actually went a little over time in order to address some of those questions, but I want to thank all of you for joining me today, for taking time out of your day to attend this webinar presentation. Thanks again to Tamron for sponsoring the presentation, and if you want to learn even more to help you optimize your photography and workflow, the Gray Learning Ultimate Bundle, you can get a 33% discount by using this link that you see here, timgray.me slash graybundle99, so you'll get the full bundle of all of the educational content that we publish through the Gray Learning website for just $99 per year. And you, that means also that as long as your subscription is active, all of that additional content that gets published over time, you gain immediate access to as well. So once again, thank you very much for joining me for today's presentation, and I will hope to see you again very soon in a future presentation as part of the Gray Learning webinar series. Thank you very much.